Propel and welcome to Propel Like a Pro live chats. My name is Jack McLean. I created Propel Like a Pro early in the year. We are a strength and conditioning business that specialises in development for football. If you're interested in working with us, head over to our website, preparelikeapro.com, where you can download free training programs as well as check out our training packages and both face-to-face -face training as well as online training. You can see Tim's jumped on, so I'm just going to send over the invitation, mate, while I'm doing that. For those that don't know, Tim Gabbett, he has 25 years experience working as an applied sports scientist with athletes and coaches for a wide range of sports. I'm super excited to, to catch up with Tim on this live format and discuss all things sports science and load management. He is progressively put in training programs for rehabilitation as well as research for training programs that are practical, coach-friendly um, and applicable to anyone with a desire to be their best. Tim's common sense approach to high performance really sets him apart. Uh, he's famous for his acute to chronic workload ratios, which I'm sure we'll go into detail during this chat, uh, and he continues to be in demand as a sports science consultant all around the world. Hey, Tim, how you going? Hey, Jack, how's things? Yeah, you going well, mate. Thanks for jumping on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on there. Yeah, it sounds okay. You can hear me clearly. There's a few guys jumping on now, so we've got some people joining us. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I sure can. Yep. So for those that they can write through questions via comment. So if that happens while you're talking about a previous question, well, I'll just keep an eye on that and scroll up and down on this screen here. And, and I'll, when we get time, I'll, I'll fit that question in. But for the most part, okay. for those that are watching that you want to send a question through to Tim, uh, all you need to do is use the question button at the bottom of your screen. And then when we get to Q&A time later on in the chat, we'll, we'll find time for that question. But thanks for jumping on, mate. Really looking forward to this chat. We'll get straight into it. So take us back to the beginning. At what age did you realise that a career in elite sport as a sports scientist was something that you were passionate about? I think intuitively I probably knew really young. As, as young as 10 years old, I was following my dad around football fields and training fields, and, and he was training training athletes, training footballers, and I used to just follow him around. And, and I learned a lot in those early days from him. And, yeah. and I, I often say I, I, I learned more. I think I learned more from him about training through doing it and through watching him and observing how he worked with his athletes than I ever did out of any textbook. So that, that like, I guess there was, in the back of my mind, there was probably something there that I wanted to, to chase up, wanted to follow up. And it's, it was probably, I always had an interest in, conditioning, strength and conditioning, and, and was always involved in that area. But I guess in my early 20s, I, I probably decided that I needed to, to go and do something formal about it and just start studying. And, and, and that's kind of where, I've, where it's taken me to, to this point now. Fantastic. So when you were following your dad around, was he looking after the strength and conditioning side of things as like a, as a trainer or was he a skills coach? And was that one-on-one? -on -one? Was, like, was he a private consultant or was he work, were you following around at clubs? It, well, it was a bit of everything. I mean, in those days, it wasn't it, it, there wasn't such a thing as a consultant so so much. It was uh, I, I think in this this is going back to early early eighties, late late seventies, and he he got paid with a pair of running shoes and might have got a tracksuit at the end of the year. So it was different days, but so he would he would train football teams, rugby league teams, um, soccer teams. But he also trained he trained a lot of sprinters through to distance runners as well. That was his his real strength was running. He he ran in a lot of in a lot of professional races when he was younger, so he knew a lot about a lot about running and a lot about how you had to run in order to get the the best mark in a professional race. So you want to get a good handicap in a race. So a lot of the time you'd run dead so that you can get a better a better handicap. Yeah, so right. it's there's a bit of there was a lot of um, physicality involved in it. You had to be fit to do it, but you also had to be smart to to make it look like you were running hard in the in the heats, so that yep. you'd get the best the <laughs> best handicap going into the final, so you could get right. you could win the cash. Yeah, um, yep, so yep. yeah, good smart, story. Eh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Sorry, I thought someone sent through a question, but they didn't. So yeah, you mentioned your dad was was a strong influence early on in your career, and and that's where being exposed to watching what he did. You recognise there was a passion within yourself as well. Were there other mentors or, or influences along the way, along your journey, that have helped you to where you are today? Oh yeah, look, I, I think I think it's really important that your your parents, in general, they they believe in you, right? So they 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 believe that you can you can achieve things you want to achieve. So both my both my parents were really good, my mum and my dad. But I, I also think it's it's pretty important that you have someone other than your your parents and other than your family that believe in you. I mean, I, I had a lot of pretty good influences. Looking back, there was school teachers, 
that really, really pushed me to to be my best at what I what I did. Like, and, and a lot of my stuff was in sport, school, the the academic part of school, but it was yeah. the, the sporting part of school, and they really pushed me hard to 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 do the best I could do there. And and I think I would probably. I probably made a lot of teams back in those days, not so much based on skill or physicality. It was just, it was based on effort. It's been so many times that I've been um, beaten in races or, or beaten in competition due to just being not physically gifted enough or not skillful enough. But uh, it's very rare that, that I get beaten on effort. Like that was something that I learned really young. You've got to actually have it. You've got to have a decent, if you're going to have a crack at it, have a decent crack at it and don't, don't die wondering. So, those those lessons that I learnt from my coaches and my school teachers and from my dad and my mum it was their their lessons that I've been able to take through to other areas of my life now that that there's a certain amount of skill involved but effort is you can't do you can't do a lot of things to a high level in your life unless you have effort. Absolutely. Yeah, and and in terms of the sports science side of things, was your dad you know, was there maybe it wasn't a called acute to chronic ratio, but was there a form of sports science in trainers back then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fitness fatigue model was was kind of first proposed around the 70s. So, but I, I doubt that um, he would have known ar- about the, the papers that were around. He, w- he probably would have known about the theory, but I, I remember talking to him about acute chronic loads yep. and, and him just saying to me, well, that's common sense, isn't it? And I said, oh, yeah, but what you've got to realize is that common sense isn't that common in, in yeah. sport. And he, and he said to me, well, great. I'll tell people that, that Tim's talking about shit that we already know. So it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nothing. It's, it levels you out pretty well. But, yeah. I mean, he, he knew and, and the good the good trainers and good, well, they weren't even called conditioning staff and they were called trainers. So yeah. the good trainers w- would, you had to work hard. There was no easy way to get to where you wanted to go without training hard and training consistently. But they also knew that you didn't train up until the day of the game at that intensity that you you tape it off and you you reduce the load to freshen your athletes up. So this whole concept of acute and chronic loads that we're talking about now, it was it was around back then. It just didn't have the, the fancy names that we give it. But Absolutely. they was they were doing it. Yeah. And going into the acute chronic ratio and the, and all the research that you've done and, and papers, what got you onto that path if you, if you were exposed to coaching and and you knew that that was a passion? Was it going to uni where you were exposed to the academic side? What stirred you on to go down the research path? I think early on when I was when I was studying, I, I probably set my sights on some some high level degrees. When I when I started out, I there was because I hadn't worked I hadn't worked as hard as I should have at school. Then I, I struggled to get into university. And then when I got into university, I found it really really tough. And I just I worked worked really hard at it because there was this this fear of not getting through the course. Then I, I, I did okay in, in a few exams. I thought, well, hang on, I might be okay at this. So I, my mind, shit, mind shift, uh, my, my state of mind shifted a little bit in that. I went, well, okay, let's not be fearful of this. Let's just do the best I can because I might be okay at it. So then once once I got to that point, I went, well, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to be okay at it, I might as well be good at it. And I might as well just push myself to be the the best I can be at it. I don't have to be I don't have to be the best in the world. I don't have to be better than anyone else. I just have to be the best that I can be. Just whatever that means to me. So that was just a goal for me. And and part of that goal was okay. Well, you've you've got through this degree now that you you thought maybe you couldn't do, and now you did it. And maybe you could push a little harder, and and maybe you could do an honours. So I, I did the honours and and did well in the honours, and then um, the PhD came up. So that it kind of one thing led to another. I don't know that I was ever really that interested in research. And now that, that might sound well, it might sound a bit strange because it's like there's I've probably you know written a lot of papers, but it was never my goal to to write a heap of papers. It it all I was doing was just working in the field, doing doing stuff trying stuff that you try every day you, you try different stuff and, and you see whether it worked and all I was doing was just keeping a journal about the kind of stuff I was doing some worked that I wrote about and some didn't work that I also wrote about and it, it just it was a logical extension to take that journal that journal yeah. entry and just kind of write a write a paper about it. and if, if people can learn from that then that's great and if it's just experiences really like some stuff worked really well and some stuff didn't work well but it's it's the stuff that didn't work well is we learn from as well. We exactly. learn from that just like we learn from the stuff that work. Yeah, and there'd be a lot of well, both maturing, but but mainly developing footballers that that watch. Uh, I know certainly my my page from a acute to chronic ratio or just general load management. When you're dealing with younger athletes, what what's an important thing 
from a philosophy point of view, how can they, I guess, read their body better or self-manage themselves in the early days for the younger athlete? It doesn't have to be football specific, but... Mm. Well, look, I think the, the, the big thing that was like a light bulb moment for me with, with load, I'd been looking at, at training load and injury for a long time. And there was this school of thought that high loads contribute to, to injuries. High loads caused overuse injury. And what I was starting to see was that our, our players who were training consistently and had the highest loads weren't the ones getting injured. It was always the ones who were at low loads who hadn't loaded for a long period of time or had been in rehab and then rushed back. And then it, it's, it just dawned on me that it's, it's not load that's the problem. It's the load you're not prepared for. And, and this is like coming back to your question of, well, how can younger athletes use this information? I, I think, I think there's two really key, key points. If you want to handle the demands of competition, then you have to train hard for that competition. You have to, to look at the demands of the sport and be ready for it. So there's no easy way to get there. You have to train hard, but it's, it's really important to consider how you get to those high loads. If you go from zero to a hundred in a very short space of time, then you shouldn't be too surprised if you get in this chronic rehab or loop where you get injured, then you get exposed to low loads because you're injured, and then you try and ramp ramp your way out of it quickly, then you get re-injured again. It's this, this chronic rehab loop. So the, the thing that I'd say to young players is build consistency in your training. Get a, get a routine and try and have a routine from week to week. This is what I'm doing Monday through to Friday or Monday through to Sunday, and prepare for the demands of your sport. But, but try and get there as safely as you can. Yeah, yeah. and it's, so it's not fearful of, of doing big sessions, is it? That, that not necessarily big sessions. As long as you've got that consistency under your belt, the big sessions actually build resilience more to, to being yeah. less likely to be injured for game day. Yeah, well, look, I think I think people people hear different things with acute and chronic load, and it, I guess it depends on where you where you come from. So if you have have more of a more of a health related background, perhaps you're more likely to go, well, I've got to make sure those changes are really small. Yeah. If you come from a strength and conditioning background, you're probably seeing that, oh no, what he's actually saying is that high loads are good. That, yeah. you know, if we can build the high loads, it, it builds physical resilience, it builds robustness. Now, there's truth in both of it. The, the one message, if I had to say one message that I wanted people to take away, it's that training is a good thing. Hard training is a good thing. You train hard, you recover hard, then you go back and you do it again. And the, the consistency that comes with that builds physical resilience and robustness, but it also builds a mental resilience as well. That you, There's a confidence that comes from consistent training, that when you have to go to that dark place in a game or in a race, that you've been there before over and over again in training and that you can handle it. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's a great message. Nico Jaras has uh, sent through... Do you, it, do you believe that the ACWR, so the acute chronic work ratio, can be a good option in people with chronic pathologies disease? Yeah, I mean, what we're, what we're talking about with the acute chronic workload ratio is just progressive overload. It's, it's progressive overload 101, and, and importantly, it's different from, from just saying, take this and see how you feel. What you're actually doing is loading relative to someone's capacity. So if we're talking about a key training principle. Progressive overload is a key training principle. So as far as I'm aware, there's no, no studies that have looked at the acute chronic workload ratio and pathologies such as tendinopathy or athletes in pain. But if you have a think about, if you were to problem solve your way through some of the challenges with, with those pathologies, how would you go about it? You would try and progressively expose your athlete, whether, they're, whether they've got a pathology or whether they're, they're in, in chronic pain, you would ex progressively expose them to some sort of stress. And the stress in this case is training. Mm. What you're trying to do is gradually improve their tolerance to that stress. It's kind of like public speaking. If, if you don't like public speaking, there's two ways you can deal with it. You can never, ever do public speaking. And then when you have to speak in public, you get so stressed that you can't get the words out or you just keep speaking in public. <laughs> you, yeah. you, you just progressively expose yourself to more and more opportunities to speak in public so that when you have to do it, it just becomes normal. And that's, that's how I would approach chronic pain, pathologies. You want to expose your athlete to the highest load that is tolerable to that individual athlete. And you monitor the response to that load. If it's a good response, then you can load again. If not, then you just adjust the load a little bit before loading again. Yeah, yeah. And for those playing team sports, and from your consultant experience when, when working with a rugby or AFL football teams, with, with applying the acute work ratio, do, is there a certain metric that is specific to that player that's important to be really across? So for instance, kicking volumes? 
uh, or, or you know, mm-hmm. high speed running, or is it a matter of a few metrics that you, you're you're looking at closely as you group? If that makes sense, rather than having twenty, do you condense it to five? Like in your experience, but where have you seen it done really well in a practical to sporting teams? So I, I think the, the the first thing we need to be careful of is is you can literally measure infinite number of variables and particularly now when there's, there's so many different wearables on the market so the, the temptation is to just measure everything you possibly can sure. but the challenge with that is, is you end up collecting numbers looking for a question and you just don't you just don't have enough time to analyze all of those different things and and what you can find sometimes is let's say we take two variables total distance and high speed running you might see that one is going through the roof and one is going down so so which one do you place more emphasis on the the way that i i typically will choose a variable is my my general approach is what is the least amount of information i need in order to do my job well what's the least amount of information i need to make a decision yep. so if, if i'm working with let's say an afl footballer or a soccer player and I've got, I'm lucky enough to have GPS, then I'll, I'll probably choose high speed running because I know it's an important high speed running ability is an important quality to develop. It's key to performance, but it's also pretty critical in terms of injury, injury risk. If you don't do enough high speed running, then it puts you at, at risk. It's like a vaccine against injury. Yep. So that's, that's a key one for me. If I'm talking about baseball pitches, then perhaps if they, if they're not, if they're not getting at that, then the amount of high speed running they, the game is going to be neg- negligible. So them 